One of my daughters asked me, she's like, are you going to like dance to the music up there? I was like, no, no, not doing that, not doing that. And then I walked up here and somebody said, oh, that, Matt. <laughs> uh, hey, I'm really glad that you're here. I'm really glad to be here. My name is Matt Smith. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, um, I just want to say welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody. If you're, if you're new, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're old... There's some old, uh, if, you're, if you're here all the time or this is your first time here, I just want to say welcome. Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, either from Bluffton, Bluffton or Fostoria uh, or even our friends from Columbia who might be joining online. Uh, we're going to say buenos dias, Liz, we miss you. Uh, uh, a group of us went to Columbia last week and, uh, and saw God do some amazing things. Uh, so we just want to say welcome. We're glad you're here this morning. This is, uh, this is the third week of our series called Learn How to Pray. Uh, it's, it's talking about breaking down barriers to real prayer. So if, uh, if you're anything like me, there's likely uh, been times in your life where you have struggled to pray or even know what or how to pray. Uh, in week one, we talked about uh, how to spend time with God in prayer. Uh, and then in week two, Ben taught about praying all the time about everything. This week, we're actually talking, we're going to look at Scripture and see what it has to say about praying with understanding. So it seems right <clears throat> that we should start out by asking God to give us understanding today. So let's, let's take a minute and pray. Uh, Father, I thank you that uh, you are the source of understanding for us. And Lord, I pray that you would, uh, that you would open our eyes to see who you are, uh, what you've done, and how you've provided for us today. God, I, I pray that you would give us genuine, real understanding um, that leads to transformation. Um, God, I thank you for everything that you've done, and we just uh, we lift up our whole morning to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, so the truth is that even though uh, all of us were created by God for relationship with Him, uh, there's many times there's, there's obstacles that, uh, that we find in our way and barriers to genuinely engaging God in prayer. Uh, <clears throat> just a brief survey over the last month or so uh, for me has exposed some common obstacles that people encounter. So <clears throat> people said things like this. <clears throat> they said, I can't pray or don't pray because uh, I don't know what to pray for. They said things like, I don't know, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, some, some people said, I, I have sin in my life and I, I don't deserve to be heard by God. Other people said, it's, uh, you know, I feel like my prayer requests are something too small or unimportant to God. Um, others were really honest and said, I'm, I'm angry. I'm angry at God, uh, so I don't know if I can pray. Um, I don't think that I will like the answer. Um, I don't think God cares. One person said, uh, um, sometimes I only want to pray shallow or surface prayers because I don't want to give God room to say something I don't want to hear. Yeah. And so uh, other people said, uh, God hasn't answered my, answered my prayer or I don't want to trust God. So now while these seem like really, uh, I mean, these are really genuine things. These are ob genuine obstacles that people encounter in praying. So uh, maybe you're like me and you can identify with something here. If so, you're not alone. Uh, the truth is we all need wisdom and understanding to really be able to unlock joy and freedom in prayer. So uh, the, to pray with understanding, the first thing, the very first thing that we have to know is that understanding comes from God, not from our own thinking. The default setting for mankind is to, uh, to look to ourselves as the source of understanding and wisdom. You know, we often look everywhere else for understanding before we look to God. We rely on our own reasoning, our own logic, and comprehension to navigate the world and our circumstances. We, we will trust science, philosophers, horoscopes, fortune tellers, our friends, and even our intuition and feelings before we turn to God. Uh, we're good at finding substitutes for prayer. Uh, if you're like me, it might be uh, uh, complaining or distraction Sometimes, sometimes even uh, a gossip or maybe attacking somebody who's hurt me. Uh, it might be telling others how I think the world and other people should change. But probably most often, it's, it's simply action, right? It's I try to take action and change circumstances and gain control of a situation uh, instead of first turning to God. There's no one who's exempt from this. 
uh, <clears throat> all of us are born fully believing that we know what's best for us. Uh, if you don't believe me, uh, after we get done here, go find a three-year-old and ask them, yep. right? They will tell you they know what's best for them, right? And everybody's there. Uh, so this fundamental problem that all of us have, it's, it's simply self-leadership. It's called sin, and it's the thing that separates us from God. So uh, it's not surprising that the Bible gives us some instruction here. So in Proverbs 3.5, uh, it says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. God knows our needs better than we do. Uh, and he wants, uh, he wants us to turn to him for wisdom and understanding that we desperately need. So in James 1.5, God gives us this instruction through James. He says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you, and he will not rebuke you for asking. Jesus says it like this. He says, all, the Father, all that the Father gives to me, uh, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I am simple. Uh, so uh, what God's doing is he's inviting us to have wisdom and understanding that we really need through Scripture. So the prophet Jeremiah says this. He says in, in chapter 9, verse 23, he says, This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom, or the powerful boast in their power, or the rich boast in their riches. But those who wish to boast should boast in this alone, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. Paul communicates it like this in Ephesians. Uh, in chapter 3, he says, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. What you have to see here is that uh, there is an understanding that's essential for growing in freedom and joy in prayer. And, and that understanding is the, the very thing that all of Scripture points to. It's, it's the gospel. Um, so the second thing to know is that the gospel really is understanding. Uh, it informs and transforms everything we do, including prayer. Uh, this truth is... On every page of Scripture, it's in every story, and it's the central point of the whole Bible. It's what Jeremiah was talking about. It's what Paul was talking about. So we're going to back up this morning just a little bit in the book of Ephesians to chapter, chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 10. It's going to be on the screen behind me. You guys can follow along in your Bible or on the screen, but uh, I want to read that. <clears throat> it says, for grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, <clears throat> there's something that we do in, in our small group a lot, and that's uh, we will read uh, a, a certain passage, but then we'll read it again in a different translation. Uh, and that different translation uh, is not a, a different it's not a different Bible. This is basically just a different translation of the original language. So what we just read was a word-for-word -word translation, uh, which is pretty self-explanatory. But we're actually going to read it again in a thought-for-thought -thought translation, which sometimes will unpack Scripture in a way that maybe makes more sense in our, our language. Sometimes it helps it to kind of jump off the page to me. So we're going to read this again in the New Living Translation, and it'll be up on the screen again. It says, for God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things that he planned for us long ago. 
So these translations use very different words to, to describe and explain the same concept and truth. Uh, they're both extremely reliable and accurate, uh, and they're also incredibly helpful in understanding the gospel. But what's really interesting here is that both of them start exactly the same. There's no other way to explain this or describe it other than you are saved by grace. Uh, there's not a different word to communicate that. Uh, and grace really is just, it's, it's a way to describe God's unmerited favor. It's, it's undeserved and it's unearned. There, it's right there in the text in, in the New Living. It says, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. It's completely a work of Jesus. So when Jesus gave his life for mine, he took my punishment, and in return, he gave me his perfect righteousness. So uh, what that means is that I'm, I'm completely forgiven, and I'm also completely loved. And, and when God looks at me, he views me as though I had lived the perfect life of Christ. God's grace through Jesus is um, almost unbelievable. Uh, it's, it's the gift that seems too good to be true, it's, it's, but it's free to anyone who will put their faith in him and receive that gift. That's the amazing truth that actually saves us, uh, gives us freedom and eternal life. So <clears throat> the question here, the real big question is, do we understand it? I mean, do we really believe it? Uh, I would argue that all of us struggle to really understand and believe this truth. Uh, most of us believe it in part, but we all struggle to comprehend it. The, that's the very reason that Paul prays later in Ephesians that they would have the strength to understand God's love for them. Uh, the same is true for us. The, the biggest obstacle to, to understanding is keeping all of this in the right order. <clears throat> the order here in Ephesians 2 is really specific and incredibly important. Uh, it is grace, then faith, then works. And if we get this out of, out of order, um, the wheels fall off the wagon, right? Everything falls apart. So uh, grace is what saves you. Faith is is just the way of receiving it. So when, when we come to faith in Jesus, almost all of us recognize that we can't earn salvation. We, we believe what the Bible says, that we are not saved by our good works, but rather God accepts us because of what Jesus has done. But here's where things often get out of order. Uh, <clears throat> now that God has saved us, we, we start to think sometimes that uh, our faith was what obtained God's grace. We, we begin to think that the quality of our faith might be the reason for God's love, uh, that somehow God loves me because of my belief or my love for him. So what happens is we take things out of order. We, we start to put faith before grace. Uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> faith is just a way of receiving God's grace. It's not, it's not the means or the reason that we receive it. Uh, maybe, maybe a better way to say this is that grace is the cause of genuine faith. God showed grace before you trusted him by faith. That grace is what caused your faith. So uh, if, if, if you go back to the beginning of Ephesians uh, 2, in verse 1, it says it like this. It says, "...once you were dead in, because of your disobedience and your many sins." You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace you've been saved. So genuine faith in Jesus can only be a result of grace, not the cause of it. And it's very easy to fall into the trap of believing that if I have faith, God will show me grace. If, if that were true, uh, the quality or quantity of our faith would be the thing that saves us. So you can see how that's easy to get that out of order. <clears throat> if we begin to think uh, that our, our faith is what secures God's love for us, we think that God loves us more when we believe and have faith, and he loves us less when we don't. 
If, if that were the case, we would actually be responsible to save ourselves. Faith simply cannot come before grace. Only, only faith in God's grace shown, shown through Jesus can save us. So uh, when we get this out of order, uh, things start to fall apart. When we place faith before grace, it's not that we don't have faith. It's, it's that our faith is misplaced. Rather than faith uh, caused by grace, we have faith that's fueled by ourselves. Faith before grace is faith in yourself. So even disbelief in Jesus, uh, disbelief in Jesus is not an absence of faith. What it is, it's the presence of a different kind of faith. It's faith in ourselves. So here's the big question. Do I have this in order? Um, do I really trust God's grace? Am I putting, do I put this out of order? Uh, am I maybe internally believing that faith or works come before grace? Do I have faith in Jesus or do I have faith in myself? So the, one of the ways that I can kind of test this and how I would think about this um, there is I think through some things that are sometimes subtle, right? Uh, we might think that, uh, I might think, do I believe that God loves me more when I have more faith? It's a good question to ask. Um, do I believe that, that good circumstances are the result of my good works or that bad circumstances are the result of God, God's punishment for my bad works? Do I believe that, God's, that my access to God is limited by the amount or quality of my faith or good works? Or, or, or do I actually believe that I can come to God with the same access and freedom that Jesus can? Um, do I believe that God hears or answer, answers my prayers based on my goodness or obedience? And I fall on that sometimes. Um, or do I believe, or do I actually believe that God uh, hears me based on the righteousness of Jesus? See, I can pray because I, I some people will say, I can't pray because I have sin in my life. I, I've got I've to clean up my act uh, before I can come to God in prayer. But if grace comes before faith, this actually invites me to pray, right? It, having sin in my life is the reason that I can actually go to God in prayer because God's, God's shown grace, right? So um, there's other ways of thinking about this that, that uh, might reveal our, you know, our wrong thinking that are more obvious. Sometimes uh, we say, well, I can't pray because I'm angry at God. Uh, I'm upset that God is not honoring my plan or that he hasn't shown me all of his. Uh, when uh, What this might do is it might expose that my faith is rather in myself than God. E even when, Because God shows grace towards me even when I was opposed to him. That's back at the beginning of Ephesians 2. So uh, another way I might do this is I, I might actually compare myself to others. And when I do this, here's what happens. I look at my faith and my works, and I measure it against this person over here, right? And so all that does is that shows me um, I'm actually putting my faith in my, uh, in my faith. <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden now I've, I've, uh, I've compared myself, and, and I'm thinking wrong about this. Because you see, all of us do that. We all get it wrong. We all actually try and put it out of order, whether it's the quality and quantity of our faith or our works, we misorder them because we put faith in ourselves rather than in Jesus. That's the essence of sin. Nobody's exempt. The simple fact is we all do it. Uh, the very reason, and that, that's the very reason that grace has to come first. If, if I think that faith or good works lead to God's grace, it is no longer grace. It's something I've earned or I've achieved. So, I want to share a story with you to kind of illustrate this. Um, last week, a group of us went to uh, Columbia, and we spent the week there working with local churches uh, to help share this same good news with people in their communities. Um, I heard some really amazing stories. Uh, what we did is we actually went out with a, a translator uh, because we don't speak Spanish. I didn't speak Spanish. Uh, so we went out with a translator and a local person from one of the churches we were with, and we went into their communities and got to talk to people. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to invite Nicole Smith to come up and share one of those stories because uh, she got to see how this was working firsthand, and I was really super encouraged by it. So here she is. Okay, so... 
Testing. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so as Matt said, we had the opportunity to share our testimony and the gospel with people in Colombia. And one of the days that I was out with the translator, my translator and the local from the church, we came to a little shop. And it was the owner of the shop that we began to talk to. And so after sharing the testimony and the gospel message, he listened. He was really nice about hearing us, but we were sort of wrapping up the conversation and he was kind of like, okay, well, thanks for sharing the information. Have a nice day. And so my translator kind of turned and said, well, he said he's not really interested. He, he said he wants to come to God his own way. So, you know, I, I think we should go. And I really felt the Holy Spirit just put it on my heart with this person to ask him a question. So I told my translator, ask him if I can just ask a quick question. And the guy was like, yeah, that's fine. So I said, what is your way to God? And he thought for a second and said, well, my way to God is to just be a good person. You know, don't, uh, don't get in trouble with people, run your business honestly, and, and just try to, to live a moral life. That, that's my way to God. And, uh, and so I said, well, how good is good enough? If, if you stand before God and you, you have your amount of right works that you've done to be able to have right relationship with him, how, how good is good enough? And he thought, it's impossible. He said, it's impossible. It's impossible to know. I mean, you just try, I, I just try to be good enough. And then you kind of just hope that that was enough that you did. And I said, well, according to the Bible, God's word says that to be right with God, it's perfection. We have to be absolutely 100% perfect to be in right standing before him. And he's like, that's impossible. Nobody can, nobody can be that perfect to be with God. And I said, uh, Jesus was. <laughs> and he's like, well, yeah, but nobody can be like Jesus. Exactly. <laughs> he said, that's why Jesus came. And he lived the perfect life for us. And he died the death that we deserved. That's why he came. And so after having this conversation, he, he, you could see the wheels turning. And he even said, he's like, I, I, need, to, I need to start thinking about what you're saying about who Jesus actually was and why he came. And so I asked, I said, well, would you read a Bible if you had a Bible? And he said, oh, yes, I would, I would read a Bible. So we had Bibles in Spanish that we were able to, to give to the locals and, uh, in the community. So I, I pulled a Bible out. I opened it to the book of John, just kind of dog-eared it. The book of Juan. The book of Juan. <laughs> yeah. I, learned my, I had to figure that one my out. Spanish, <laughs> my Spanish for the week. And so I opened it, and I, I pointed out, I said, listen, the whole Bible is a book about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But, but start here. Read this one, because this specifically talks about Jesus coming to earth and what he did for you. And so he opened the Bible. He looked at it, and he actually started to cry. And he said, I've never touched a Bible before in my life. Thank you so much. And he said, I'm, I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this book. So it was really neat. It was a great opportunity, and we're still praying for him. I mm -hmm. hope he gets to know Jesus. Absolutely. Thanks, Nicole. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, isn't that a cool story? Um, it, so here's what happens. If faith comes before grace, how can you ever know? How can you ever know if it's enough? I mean, how will you know when you have enough faith? How will you know when the quantity or the quality of your faith or your works is enough? It's good enough. Uh, this is what happens. Because when you, when you believe that faith comes before grace, you've turned your faith into a work, right? And, and you will then have all the anxiety and pressure that religion puts on people. You actually have to become the author of your own salvation, right? You have to keep up your faith because if, if you don't, it, you, you'll fail, right? Uh, you have to keep up your works, your surrender, your obedience, uh, you, you, uh, because that's what brought, your faith is what brought grace at that point. And, and it all hangs on you, and now you're responsible to hold all of it up, and it's impossible. So what I love about this story is <clears throat> this is the story of God's grace coming first, right? It came to someone who didn't have faith, right? Not because of his faith. God was showing this man that, it, that his grace is the only thing that can save us. 
right? But what I also love about this story is on the other side of it is, is we get to see the, someone acting by faith that came from grace, right? So that's what happens. When you see the truth of the gospel, uh, when you begin to understand and experience God's grace, faith is just what happens. You start to act on that grace, and you're actually doing because of it. You think differently, you act differently, you pray differently. Sometimes you fly to Columbia to tell someone you've never met uh, who speaks a different language the good news that God loved us too much to let us try and earn our way to Him. He gave us His grace before we had faith, and now by faith, the only thing, we do the only thing that we can do with a gift. We receive it. Right? You can't earn, you can't earn a gift or it ceases to be a gift. <clears throat> so the third thing to realize here is understanding that comes from the gospel is what unlocks real joy and freedom in prayer. <clears throat> what you have to see here is that faith that comes from grace is different. Uh, it, it can actually rest. It can rest in Jesus. It actually has to rest in Jesus. It's, it's not trying to earn what it already has. Faith that comes from grace is uncontainable. Just a lot like grace that comes from faith would be unsustainable. Faith cannot produce grace. It's impossible. Only God's grace can produce genuine faith. Faith in Jesus is impossible unless grace comes first. If, if you know Jesus, you know that your, your faith is a miracle that flows from God's grace. The faith that saves you is not some self-created, drummed-up faith. It is faith that your salvation is not from yourself. It's a complete dependence on the work of Jesus. Saving faith is faith that rests in Jesus. The kind of faith that comes from grace overflows with understanding. Understanding that because of God's incomprehensible love for us, we can actually depend on him. <clears throat> That's the type of faith that we can actually pray for. That kind of understanding transforms everything. Uh, it changes your thoughts, your prayers. Uh, it, it changes our actions. It changes not just what you pray for or how you pray. It changes why you pray. You see, grace transforms prayer. When you can trust uh, God by faith that comes from grace... You can pray differently because you, ha you have what you could never earn. Uh, God is constantly changing the way that I pray and the way that I think. Um, for me, it might look something like this. Um, I am not loved. Uh, I'm loved not because of my faith or my works, but because of Jesus' love and sacrifice for me. So now I can pray and declare my love for God with gratefulness and freedom instead of obligation and insecurity. I have real joy that I cannot lose because I am secure in Jesus. So now I can thank God for his grace and mercy even when circumstances are hard and painful. I have confidence knowing that God has gone before me in everything and that the battle for my life has already been won. So now I can pray for others who need God's grace just like I do. I can know that God cares for me no matter the circumstance, and I can trust him because the only, he's the only one who gave his life for me when I did not deserve it. I can encounter, uh, I, I can endure whatever I encounter, not because I'm strong, but because Jesus endured it all for me and his spirit lives in me. I can love others not because it will gain me love, but because I already have it completely in Jesus. I can even trust God when it's painful and I don't see the outcome or even the good because I know that he's the only one who knew what was good for me and gave me life when I was dead. Because of the gospel, I can pray and confess sin and self-leadership and repent with joy in my heart knowing that God has already forgiven me. I can also forgive other people who have wronged me because God's forgiven me. So what you have to know from this is, as God transforms us through grace, our understanding of it grows. Just like Paul prayed for the Ephesians, uh, that they would have power to understand uh, Christ's love, 
that's the same for us. <clears throat> Growing in this understanding is like any growth. Uh, it takes time, and it's painful, and it's hard. <laughs> but what comes out the other side is priceless. Um, so what it means is you don't actually have to have all of this figured out to pray. God invites you to come to him by his grace, not because of your faith or works, but because of Jesus. You can actively trust God in prayer. So trusting God starts with trusting the only one who showed you perfect life-saving grace and died so you could receive it. It works like this. Experiencing God's grace causes your faith to grow. As your faith grows, your prayers actually change. Because of God's grace, you can pray even when you're frustrated and angry at God. There is nothing too small or too big to bring to him. Because grace came first, you don't have to be afraid to talk with God. Praying with faith that comes from grace uh, means that sometimes you won't see the answer to the thing that you're praying for. Instead, even when you don't see the answer or know the outcome or, or the pain never goes away or you don't understand why, you, you choose to trust God because he's the only one that died so that you could live. He's the only one that moved heaven and earth so you could be right with him. Uh, he's, he's the only one that always knows what's best and is doing what's perfect. He's the only one with all-knowing perspective and perfect love for us. The truth is, he's God and I'm not. So even when trusting him seems impossible or painful or hard, because of who he is and what he did, we can trust him. Not in the hope of receiving something because of our faith, but knowing that he is God and gives us grace before we even have faith. So this isn't just restricted to talking to God, but, but listening as well. The understanding of the gospel even corrects our prayers while we're praying them. You know, God is constantly reminding me uh, about the truth of the gospel as I'm praying. Most of my prayers start out one direction, maybe, maybe with I, I, I know what I'm praying for and I know the uh, result that I'm looking for, and, and God encou I encounter God's grace and he reminds me of it and, and changes the direction of my prayer. Um, the ultimate expression of God's grace influencing prayer uh, happened in Matthew 26, verse 39. Uh, this is actually Jesus praying before his death, it, the Bible says it like this. It says, he went on a little further and bowed, his, bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. So Christ gave us the perfect example of what it looks like to trust God by faith that comes from grace. Only because he did that can I do that? That's the only reason I can be saved. While I was dead in my sin, he saved me by his grace. Now I can depend on him by laying down my will, my agenda, my demands, my understanding, and instead relying on his. This can only be done by grace. Faith and works are both depending fully on God. Faith really is resting in Jesus, resting in his work, not my work. <clears throat> Do you see it? You, you see how, how grace leads to faith and faith to works? Be, because, because of God's grace, I can completely trust him without knowing the outcome. Because I trust him, I can walk forward in complete dependence. And that's, that's all that faith and works are. It's depending on Jesus. Real, genuine prayer with understanding is simply depending on him. So here's a perfect example of how God uses his grace to grow our faith. <clears throat> I talked to a friend of mine this week, and I asked him, I said, hey, what, are you, what do you think are some obstacles to prayer? What are some obstacles you've encountered to prayer? Uh, they uh, typed a response to me, and uh, I, it, was, it was more than I expected, uh, and I want to share it with you. Um, they said, I can tell you that for me, lately, the most common obstacle to prayer is my own pride and self-confidence. My most common substitute for prayer is excessive planning. And they, they said, uh, James 4, 13 through 16. And you guys can look that up later. It was, it was super encouraging. Um, 
she, she said, I treat life like a game of chess, trying to think ahead as many moves as I possibly can to control the outcomes of what I perceive to be the best thing for me and those that I love. And even when I do pray, I misunderstand prayer. And God often has to stop me mid-sentence because I am seeking my own pleasure and my own solution instead of his will. And then she says, cites James 4, uh, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Then, they, then she says, there are occasional moments where I come to him with humility, admitting that I have no idea of what's best. <laughs> And that is when I most clearly see his love and faithfulness and his infinite wisdom. He always answers my prayers with grace in a way that glorifies him, no matter how tainted they are by my own selfishness and pride. What you just heard is faith that comes from God's grace. That's what the gospel does. It changes us. What I love about this is how God spoke through scripture uh, and she heard his voice. By the way, that's actually what prayer is. Um, Prayer is asking, it's listening, it's responding. God transforms our prayers through the gospel. Through prayer, God is transforming us. Through the gospel, uh, the Holy Spirit leads us in truth, uh, corrects our thinking, and gives us the perfect gift that we didn't know we needed. You know, he translates for us when we don't know how to speak, and he helps us to say, not my will, but yours. So having understanding does not mean that you're perfect. Uh, it actually means, it, it's actually knowing that you aren't, and, and trusting that Jesus was perfect for you. If you want the freedom and joy that comes through understanding God's grace, I, I might some, suggest a couple, a couple potential next steps. <clears throat> The first one's really, really simple. Uh, It's pray. Just pray. Just pray and ask God. Ask God to show you how his grace changes everything. Ask him to change you. Ask him to to teach you how to depend on him. Come to him in prayer because of his grace. Talk to him because he's the only one who's walked in your shoes and done it perfectly for you. He's the only one who gave you grace before you have had faith. Um, <clears throat> I was, uh, I don't know why my kids were this big in that area. And, uh, um, I was, um, I was trying to do it on my own, right? I was trying to, uh, I was trying, I was, I was putting faith and works before grace and, uh, I had no joy. I remember I had a friend who shared with me, um, the joy and, and peace that he had in following Christ. And I thought, this guy must be a better Christian than I am. And uh, because I thought that this was about my works and my faith. And uh, over time, God started to show me, because I prayed and I asked God, I'm like, I don't understand that. That doesn't even make sense to me. And so God showed me through the gospel, through this Ephesians 2.8 here, that I'm saved not by my works, but by his grace. And God transformed my life through that. And now I can say I have genuine joy and peace and freedom because of God's grace. So you can pray and ask for that. The, I, the second thing that I would, I would point you towards is look for the gospel in Scripture. And not just in, in the, the accounts of Christ, but like all through the Bible. The Old Testament, the New Testament, all of it points to what Jesus, who Jesus is, what he's done, and, and the good news of the gospel. So read it. Um, and the third thing is, is kind of like that. I would say you don't have to do that alone. You can actually do that with other, other people. Um, joining a small group is just one way of doing that. And we're like right at the end of our small group semester. So uh, you could join one today and it'd be over next, next week. Uh, but what I might suggest is I would suggest actually just grab someone you know and ask them if they want to read uh, scripture and talk about it together. Um, that might sound weird. That might sound weird and kind of outside your comfort zone. But let me tell you, uh, God, I promise you, God uses those friendships to help us grow. So I have a friend who asked me about four years ago, uh, we were kind of talking about this topic one day, and he, he called me, he says, hey, can we get together and, and have breakfast and talk about God's grace? And I was like, yeah, we can do that. Um, 
I didn't know where that was going to go. Um, I didn't even, I didn't really know my friend Steve then, but uh, I can tell you today, he's one of my closest friends. We still get together almost once a week to do the same thing. And God is showing both of us how to depend on him by doing that together. So it's not something you have to do alone. But if you're here this morning and you're, you're hearing this and maybe you're where I was uh, and, and you, you don't have the complete unshakable hope that comes from receiving God's grace, if you're still trying to do it on your own, uh, going your own way, or you're depending on anything other than Jesus to save you or earn God's acceptance, that could actually change right now. You could receive God's grace today by faith that comes from grace. The Bible says if we turn away from our self-leadership and, and trust Jesus to save us, that we'll be free. If, if you want to receive that gift today, it is as simple as praying and asking God. You can do it right now. In fact, in a minute, uh, we're going to sing one more song. But before we do, um, I want to take some time together and just really pray. I mean, let's, let's, all, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes and uh, And we're just going to ask God this question. God, what are you saying to me through your word right now? And then let's let's just take a minute and listen. In just a minute, we're going to sing another song. And we're going to have... uh, prayer leaders who are going to be in all four corners of the room. They're actually making their way right there right now, and they are ready to pray with you about anything. Um, If you want to pray, they're ready to pray with you. Um, But I want to take just a second to talk to anyone who's hearing God's voice today uh, and inviting him to, uh, that he's inviting you to to salvation. He's saying, uh, he's saying, come to me, find my grace, receive it. Uh, if you've never trusted uh, Jesus to save you, if you're doing it your own way, if you are, uh, um, if you're carrying all the weight of trying to be good enough and earn God's grace on your own, um, you can be free today. You can receive the gift of God's grace today uh, and know with complete and total confidence that you're saved. If that's you, um, I want to encourage you, while we sing this last song, just slip out of your seat and go find one of these people uh, and and pray with them uh, and and put your faith in Christ. Don't wait. Uh, You can actually begin today, right now, to understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love for you is. But first, I want to pray for you. Let's, let's all go ahead and stand. We're going to sing here in just a second. Let's stand up. I want to pray for you, uh, and then I want to invite you to come and pray if you need prayer. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw every single person who needs prayer uh, in Jesus' name right now. Amen. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to learn more about Lighthouse Community, check out our website at mylighthousecommunity.com or connect with us on Facebook.